headed, you know? And um, um, I, he said, Richard, he says, don't you think I know better than you do? And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, I want, I, want to, I want to remind you of two things. He said, first of all, he said, he says, whenever I go to judge a man, I don't put the tape measure around his head. I put it around his heart. Now, I'm not a very brilliant man, but you cannot accuse me of one thing, and that is this, not having heart. I've got heart, friend. I've got, I've got the heart. And he said, the second thing I want to remind you of is that I will not judge you according to somebody else's giftings. I just don't get into the comparison game anymore. I just don't do that. And, um, and you know what? I think Judgment Day is going to be a real funny day. You know, because there's going to be, there's going to, we're going to be all lined up there, you know, and, and you're going to have this, this big shot. Let's say Children's Church, since we're Children's Church pastors, okay? Children's Church youth pastor. I mean, Children's Church pastor. See, I can't even say it without saying youth pastor. Children's Church pastor. Okay, and he had a youth group that grew to th uh, children's group. <laughs> Forget this. I'm talking youth. Okay, he had a youth group that grew to four or five hundred, and all of a sudden, everybody started talking about how wonderful he was. And you know what? He started believing it. And so what he did is he started getting on the plane, going around, telling, doing seminars, and telling everybody how to do it. And, and, and we'll just call his name Mike, you know. And, and up ahead of Mike, though, is, uh, is Jack. Poor Jack, you know, he's, he's bivocational, maybe volunteer. Maybe he's even full-time. But all of, his life, all of his life, for 20 years, he had a youth group no larger than 15. You know why? Because when God created Jack, God gave Jack the ability to pastor 15 kids. Hello. And Jack comes up there, and, and Jack Stink comes up with Jesus, and Jesus goes, Jack! He jumps up, Jack! Oh, Jack! Oh, I'm so proud of you. Come here, Jack! God, oh, Father, this is Jack. This is the one I've been bragging about. Oh, Jack, come here, man. Let me, Father, let me tell you about Jack. Let me remind you. I know you know, but let me remind you. We gave him the ability to pastor 15 kids. And for 20 years, he pastored 15 kids. 15, everyone's about to, about to jump up to 20, but, you know, 15 kids. And, and Jack's going, whoa, you know. And, and Jesus goes, Jack, 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 come on in, man. There's a mansion back here for you. Come on in. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And you got this snot, you know, this snot youth pastor in the back of the line. 500 kids. We call his name Mike. And he's hanging around with all of his snot youth pastor friends. You know how all the snots hang around with the snots. You know, all the big wigs hang around with all the big wigs. They never have time for us little people, do we? Hello. I, I, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. And, and, and Mike goes, 15. Watch this. And he goes, hey, Jesus. Ha, <laughs> ha. And Jesus goes, oh, yeah, hey, Mike. Mike, Mike, 500, 500, Jesus, 500. Jesus goes, yeah, I know. I know you're a slouch. Slouch? Five, a slouch? He goes, Mike, let me tell you something, buddy. You, your youth group began to grow a little bit, and all of a sudden you got, got a little bit of recognition. People started singing your praises, and you got the big head. You started jumping on the, on the plane, and instead of taking your kids, you're jumping on the plane going everywhere. Neglecting your kids. You know what, Mike? Let me tell you something. I gave you the ability to raise up a thousand kids. There are 500 kids going to hell because you are on a plane telling the world about your story. Come on in, you slouch. There's a little old shack back there for you. <laughs> now, friend, I don't know what you think it's going to be like on Judgment Day, but friend, I'm telling you, I, that's what, exactly what I think it's going to be like. I believe it's going to be exactly that way. And, um, I'm not, I don't have any great words of wisdom for you this morning, but here's what my prayer is. So when we get through here in about an hour, will you give me an hour? When we get through in an hour, this is my cry. You're going to love God more, and you're going to love children more. And, and God, I, I believe this morning, I got up early this morning, just antsy in my britches, friend. I'm just antsy. I'm full. I'm full. See, now, Pastor Van, see, I'm not going to do what Pastor Van said. He said, take your time. What he doesn't realize is many times I'll preach four hours straight. And uh, I'm not going to do that to you, okay? But, but let me just share with you, let me share with you my heart this morning. And um, at the end of the session, I want to give, as, as I think I have a couple hundred of tapes by John Maxwell and catalogs. John Maxwell is my <laughs> savior on earth, okay? I, and I, I mean that in the right way, okay? I, I believe that the reason why many of our ministries do not grow is not because of lack of anointing, but because of lack of leadership and how to deal with people. I'm just an avid believer in that, and I have about 200 tapes and catalogs. I'll just put them up here, and you can until they're gone, okay? So uh, those are free for you, and um, if, you, if you come with a group from a church, why don't you just take one bunch so that maybe everybody get one? Okay.
In your notes, let me I just simply entitle it Shepherding Lambs. Look at a couple of scriptures that we have here for you. Isaiah chapter 40. Can I just stop for a minute? I got to say this. You know what? I didn't get excited. You know, I, I was so excited about the Spirit of the Lord moving a while ago when we were worshiping the Lord. And, you know, I go, you know, even if it cuts in my time, I don't really care. You know why? Because that's exactly what we need in our churches. Let me tell you what. This is what your children need in their churches. We need, to allow, we need to allow our children and our teenagers the freedom to worship once again. Do you, realize, do you realize that freedom is an opportunity to release the pleasures and the pressures of life unto the Lord? And see, it's a very valuable tool. See, about last year sometime, the Lord, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, Richard, he said, when I created you and when I created man, I knew that they were going to live in a pressure-packed world. See, God knew every one of us live under pressure. It doesn't matter what country you're from, what, what social status you are, what color skin you are, what type of ministry you're in. Every one of us live under pressure. And God knew that if he did not create some natural release valves inside of us to release the pressure, that we'd all go loony. Hello. See, this is the reason why a lot of people are in mental hospitals and so forth and so on, because they don't understand how to relieve the pressure that, that, that comes upon us every day. And the Lord showed me that there are three natural release valves that, that he created inside of us uh, to release that pressure. The first one, the first one's this, crying. Now, do I have any bachelors in the house? Any bachelors? Let me see. Bachelors in the house. I'm not ashamed of it. Okay, okay. Okay, bachelors in the house. Okay, first of all, a definition of a bachelor is a young man who's never had the opportunity to ruin a woman's life, okay? <laughs> now, now, fellas... For you few bachelors in, in the room, let me just give you a little premarital counseling, okay? One day, if God is, is so good to you and he allows you to get married, one day you'll come home from work and you'll be working really hard and you'll come home and you're going to open the front door and your wife is going to be in the living room crying her eyeballs out. And when you see your wife cry, guilt will immediately hit your heart. Okay, and you'll run up to her and go, sweetheart, sweetheart, I'm, what did I do? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She goes, you didn't do anything. Well, baby, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Well, what are you crying for? I don't know. <laughs> but this is the reason why most women will outlive most men. Except for me. I'm a crybaby, and I'm proud of it, John. I've already cried this morning, you know? And listen, crying's good for you. How many of you realize that? It's good for you. How many of you have just, I mean, just, I mean, just things like everything's about to fall apart and you just can't handle it anymore and you just have yourself a good cry. <laughs> you get those heave things, you know. <laughs> and after you get through, you go, oh, I sure do feel so much better. Absolutely nothing's changed, but you feel a lot better, don't you? That's, that's one release valve that God gave to us to release the pressure is crying. The second one is laughing. Yeah. Now, doesn't everybody love to be around the clown? You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, everybody loves to be around the, the, the clown, and everybody loves to laugh. You know, we have a couple of DJs on, on 88.5 88 in the morning that are hilarious. This one guy, all he does is laugh. My daughter and I was talking about this morning. All he does is laugh. He just laughs at the other guy's jokes the whole time. But you know what? I'll, I'm going down the road, and I'm just laughing. I'm laughing at him laughing. You know? just... And I'll be honest with you. When I get around youth pastors and people that work with children, I get real nervous because most youth pastors, they're pretty clever. They're witty. I mean, they're just sharp. They're just like that. Me? No, friend. But you put, you put two or three of these youth pastors together, and they'll get to cutting one another. Just, dah, dah, dah. I mean, friend, they can, they can get, come with their comebacks, you know? I'm one of those guys, four hours later, I go, oh, I should have said that. <laughs> Do I have any in the house? Anybody relate? Thank you, Jesus. I'm not the only stupid slow one. But have you ever wondered, listen, have you ever wondered, I'm going somewhere, have you ever wondered why, why do people come home from all across America, they come home from a hard day at work or our kids come home from school, okay, the pressures have been mounting up, and what do they do? They sit in front of a TV set, and for four or five hours, they sit there and watch sitcom after sitcom after sitcom. Why? Because they want to laugh. They got to get that pressure out. It's a way of relieving the pressures that have been building up all day long. Every one of you been in this situation. You'll have a tense meeting. I mean, heads are about to roll, okay? And, and some idiot doofus ball will say the most stupid off-the-wall thing, and everybody go, ah! 
And what happens? Tension's gone. Gone. See, laughter is a way of releasing the pressure. The third thing is, is let's see, is the shout. Isn't there something exhilarating about getting together at a conference or you know, football game? Who cares where it's at? I mean, and just you, you know, get together with a crowd and just everybody's going, ah! I mean, there's something like, ah! I mean, there's something exciting about the shout, and there's something supernatural, really, that takes place in the shout. One of my favorite sermons I ever preached was the five shouts in the Bible. What's all the shouting about? Oh, Jesus. But anyway. But there's something, there's something exhilarating about shouting. And, um, and, and listen, don't tell anybody, but I have literally done this, okay? There's times here at work that pressures will just get up on me, you know, and I just, you know, and, and I'll literally get up, dismiss myself quietly, go to another building where nobody else around, close the door, turn off the lights, you know, I'll be in darkness, and I'll just help myself a good fit. Ah! Ha, 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 ha. Some of you are ready to go lunch now, aren't you? <laughs> Listen to this guy. I'm probably more sane than you are, though. I'd rather go scream and shout in an empty room than I would my, my assistant or go home and scream at my wife and my children. Hello. But how many of you realize that after you get through shout, man, you just go, oh, man, I feel so much better now. Thank you, Jesus. Now catch this. Catch this. All three of these release valves should be experienced in our church services, every worship service. We should have the worship start up and you got somebody coming to the church and they're under the burdens of life. They're about to buckle and they're over here crying their eyes. Out, oh God, please help me deliver me, Jesus. And you got somebody else over here. Man, everything's going great for them. You know, they're over. Woo Yes, 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 Jesus. Oh, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. You got somebody else over here in the middle going, ah, give me that devil. Ah! But do you know what we do? Hello, don't get me started. But you know what we do? Any, even in our Pentecostal churches. Anytime somebody gets a little emotional, we run up to them and go, All right now, son, I know, Dan, you just need a little bit of tension. You calm down there now, boy. No wonder our people in our Pentecostal churches can't wait for the preacher to shut up on Sunday morning so they can run home with some of their buddies, grab a Coke and peanuts, sit in front of their favorite bowl game. And their buddy tells the joke and they go, oh. <laughs> good joke, man, I got to remember that one tomorrow at work. And then they're watching the game and the opposing team gets the ball and they go for a touchdown. They go, oh, God, oh, Jesus, we're never going to win this game. Oh. And then they get the winning touchdown. They go, oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, good game, good game, good game, good game. You know what they're doing? They're worshiping. See, the question is not, are you going to worship? The question is, what are you going to worship? We are worship beings. And let me tell you something. Our children need to worship. The Lord spoke to my heart and he said, there's three things he's wanting to restore to this generation, through this generation. That was the worship, the intercession, and the prophetic. I believe that with all my heart, friend. And we've got to take the lid off and we've got to let our children have freedom to worship. Amen? Let me tell you something. More will take place during a genuine move of God in a worship service than anything you've got to say. Hello. Hello. And we need to, we need to, we need to, and let me tell you something. You might go, well, we don't have a great worship team. You know, friend, welcome. You know, I, I went, I went 12 years without a great worship team. There were many times when all I had was a CD. 
or cassette. You know what I'm saying? And, and we, we'd sing with cassette. But I made up my mind years ago I was not going to preach until we first worshipped. See, Judah plows. It gets the heart ready for the word. Don't believe me, talk to rock singers. They'll tell you they got a message for this generation. And, and you know what? It, do whatever you can with whatever you've got. See, for 12 years, I led worship for my, for my own ministry. Trust me, it was pitiful. It was sad. But God knew it was going to be sad, and so God, in his sovereign knowledge of my ministry, put a verse of scripture in the Bible that says this, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I fulfilled the verse of scripture, friend. You don't need to leave that one. Just leave that one alone. I fulfilled it, okay? Twelve years I did it. Listen, worship anyway. Amen? Well, let's talk about shepherding lambs. Isaiah 40. I'm going to have to move fast, but we'll get there. Isaiah 40.10. <sighs> See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Notice that it says that God himself takes the lambs, the little ones, and he gathers them in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. In John chapter 21, we have the story where Jesus has already been crucified. He's come back. He's, he finds his disciples going back to fishing. And, and you know the story. He, he gathers, he, they, he brings them in. He has fish already ready for them. They're around the campfire eating fish and talking. When Jesus directly speaks to Peter and he says this, he said, when they had finished dining, Jesus said, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And he answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you really love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said it to him a third time. And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Lord, you know everything. Thou knowest that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I find it interesting. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've never seen it until I was studying for this conference. I find it interesting that Jesus tells Simon Peter to first feed the lambs. Not feed the sheep, feed the lambs. You know, and I don't want to give you reason to start getting upset and all that kind of stuff, but let me tell you something. Judgment Day scares me. It really does. I think it's good. I think we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And I think that there's going to be some churches that's going to be judged because Jesus said, first of all, to feed the sheep, I mean the lambs. We see that the lambs are often Jesus' priority. Who did he say would be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Those who come as a little child. Who do you say would come? Where does the perfected praise come from? The lips of... And, and, and we see Jesus constantly putting children and youth ahead of the adults. But if you look at the average church budget... And again, I'm not wanting to try to stir up stuff inside of you, okay, because I know children are priority for you. But it scares me how adults give money to spend on themselves. They spend it all on themselves. You look where all the money's spent at, and it's for all the adult ministries. It's for their sanctuaries, for their comfort, for their conveniences. And the children get scraps and leftovers if they get that. That scares me. I have to be honest with you, that scares me. And it is a pet peeve of mine because I do believe wholeheartedly with Brother John that it's better to prepare than to repair. I believe that. I've said that for years. Not exactly those words, but I've said that for years. 
And it scares me that we oftentimes have everything backwards in our churches. But having said that, let me just talk to you for a few moments and, and encourage your heart this morning with how we need to shepherd our lambs. Number one, a true shepherd must love his sheep or his lambs. A true shepherd, first of all, loves his lambs. I have said for years that youth ministry is not about gadgets, it's not about dramas, it's not about, it's not about worship teams, it's not about great choirs, it's not about anything like that, it's not about programs, it's simply four words. You love God, love teenagers. You can put love God, love children if you want. It's just simply those four words. In fact, Jesus said everything is summed up in this. The love of the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Everything hinges upon that great commandment. And ministry is simply loving God and loving teenagers, loving God, loving children. That's all it is. Ministry is not something you do. Ministry is something you are. And if we're ever going to shepherd our children, it's going to come out of a heart of love. See, a genuine, see, we've got to understand Proverbs 19.22 has been burning in my heart now for over a year. Proverbs 19.22 says, what a man desires is unfailing love. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that what every one of us want is unfailing love, unconditional, unfailing, consistent love and acceptance? That's exactly what every one of us are yearning for. As I go off and I do youth pastor conferences, I do one a month. I never miss a youth service. Very rarely will I ever miss a Sunday. I only go for two days a month. It's a commitment that I made to the Lord because the Lord said, Richard, I don't need another hotshot national speaker. I have, only, I have many of them that are a lot better than you are, but there's only one youth pastor at Brownsville, and you better keep it a priority. And so my young people know I will never miss a youth service. I've only missed one, and that was for my good friend, Jeannie Mayo. That's the only one I've missed in four years. And my young people say, oh, Jeannie, go, 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 because we all love Jeannie. But, but listen, we, uh, we, uh, we've got to love our teenagers unconditionally. And whenever I go off and speak, it, it doesn't matter where I go, I always have, it almost always is a, a, a middle-aged woman who comes up to me during a conference, and she's crying unconditionally, uncontrollably. And she says, Brother Richard, teach me, teach me. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. I want to touch these teenagers so bad. My house, there's always at least two dozen, three dozen kids in my house. They're all the time over my house. And Richard, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. And I'm sitting there going, sweetheart, you need to be doing the conferences is what you need to be doing. Because you're doing exactly what needs to be done. You don't have to know what you're doing. All you have to do is love Jesus, love teenagers, and you know what? That's all it takes. Hello. See, we many times think that we have to know everything. Friend, if I had to know everything I was doing, I wouldn't be doing very much. But see, a, a true shepherd will love his sheep, and, and, and because of that, a true shepherd, in your notes, will sacrifice his own well-being for the well-being of his sheep. See, he's willing to make sacrifices, personal sacrifices, personal dreams for the sake of his, of his sheep. You know what I learned a long time ago? I learned that I can get in a car and drive to Atlanta a whole lot quicker than I can get in a busload of, with, with teenagers and go to Atlanta. How many of you realize you can go a lot further by yourself than you can taking people with you? You know one of the things that I have done? I have sacrificed. I have sacrificed my own ministry and dreams so that I could raise up some teenagers who could go forth and do the work of the Lord. See, I can't travel quite as fast when I take people with me, but I'm willing to sacrifice my well-being. I'm willing never to have my name maybe as, my name is as big as it could possibly be. I'm willing not to take advantage of revival and, and the grace of God that's been upon my life so that I could stay put and pour my life into some teenagers. See, a shepherd is willing to sacrifice their own well-being for the sake of the well-being of their children. In John 10, Jesus said that he is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. See, a shepherd understands that his success or her success is based upon their sheep's success. See, our success is based upon the condition of our sheep. And if our sheep are healthy, then we're successful. 
if they're weak, anemic, and there's, there's matted wool and so forth and so on, then we are a failure as a shepherd. And it's important that we communicate to our children the love of God. Let me share with you very quickly why it's important to communicate the share of love of God. And I'm going to move through this fast because I've got a lot of material I need to cover. So be ready. One reason why we've got to communicate clearly the love of God to our children is because many of them do not feel loved by anyone at all. Many of them do not feel loved by anyone at all. You would be astonished if you was, to, if you was just to do survey and just talk to kids. You'd be astonished at how many feel like that nobody really cares. Because you know what? Even moms and dads are so busy nowadays with their second jobs so that they can have a pool in the backyard and a bigger house and a car and they don't spend time with their children. Hello. They don't spend time with their children and their children don't even know their parents love them. I was reading today in Proverbs as, as I, I do every day with my teenagers. I always read the proverb of the day and, and in the proverb today it said, and I can't find it at the moment, here we go, it said that, that the parents are to be the pride of their children. The parents are to be the pride of their children. And, and when I read that this morning, it just jumped out at me. I thought, dear God, Lord, I want to be, I want my son, I want my daughter to be proud of me. I want them, you know, but you know, today, a lot of times children, their parents aren't their pride. You know what? They got, they're, they're worshiping some hero that can hit a lot of baseballs or can throw a football. That's who their hero is. You know what? I want to be my son's hero. I got, I got so blessed the other day. I took my son to an Atlanta Braves game. I told him I'd do it, so we, we made time at, 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 last week, matter of fact. And I took him to a game, and, and on the way there, he was dreaming about getting Chipper Jones' base, uh, autograph on his baseball. And, and I remember on the way there, he, he, he turned to me, and he said, Dad, he said, has anybody ever asked you for an autograph? And with pride, I said, yes, son. He goes, Really? He said, where? I said, well, I go off and do conferences. A lot of times I have people ask me to sign stuff. And he, then he said, well, when you do it, do you scribble? And I, <laughs> I said, no. I said, I always, you know, he says, what do you write? And I said, well, I usually write something like, Saint so-and-so, may the Lord use you to touch your generation, loving Jesus, Brother Richard. And he goes, and you don't scribble? I said, no. He says, why not? Everybody else does. <laughs> but you should have seen my little son's chest go, when he found out that people got his dad's autograph. <laughs> but see, they need to know that some many pe children don't even know that anybody loves them. You realize that many children can go through an entire day without hearing the words, I love you? You go, no way, yes way. Listen, I was, I was 18 years old, not close to 19 years old, before I remember the very first time my father ever said to me, he loved me. It was when I was in my car, packed up to go to Southeastern Bible College. About midnight, I was pulling out of the house. I was driving through the night. And my dad, for the very first time that I could ever remember, came out. He said, son, I love you. There's children and there's teenagers. You'd be astonished, even in your churches. You think, not my church people. Huh, you'd be surprised, friend. You'd be surprised how many children will go through a day and never hear the words, I love you. They, we need to express our love to our children. The second reason why is because many of them don't feel very lovable. See, because they don't hear the words, they don't feel very lovable. And let me just read it for you in your notes. It's, in our society, love and acceptance are things that must be earned by physical appearance or the ability to perform in some expected manner. And many teens and even children, as far as that goes, feel ugly and awkward because of the physical, emotional, and social changes that are occurring during puberty. And these feelings are then reinforced by the cruelty of their peers who jeer and mock their appearance uh, or performances in some certain activity. Let me tell you, wounds are inflicted upon our children every day. I couldn't believe, if, you, if my son will be here later on, he's at, he's at a, a field trip right now with some homeschoolers. But you meet my son, my son's a very normal, normal child. He's 4'7", he's, uh, weighs 60 pounds. And I, can't, I, I could not believe what I heard him say the other day, about a month ago. Uh, he took his shirt off, and, and he was going to put it right back on. We were going swimming, and he put it back on. I said, son, what are you doing? He, he says, oh, I, I'm fat. I said, what? I said, no, you're not. 
And he almost started crying. My son's very sensitive. His name's Caleb, and I well named him because he definitely has a tender spirit. And um, he almost started crying. I said, fat? I said, son, you are not fat. You can almost count every one of his ribs. But what had happened was is he was playing with one of his other friends in this church, and one of his other friends said, you're fat. And that went deep in his spirit. Went deep in his spirit. Let me tell you what, a lot of our children don't feel very lovable. You realize a lot of them, their parents tell them, why can't you be like so-and-so? And the only time that many of our parents talk to their children is to correct them or to tell them what to do. I cannot tell you how many times I've had conversations with teenagers that say, the only time my parents talk to me is to tell me what to do or to correct me. And our children, many of our children feel unlovable. And we need to express our love to them. Another reason why we need to express our love is because many do not understand what true love really is. Man, are we messed up today or what? We don't know what love is. See, most of society today has, has degraded love to be some emotional feeling or lustful thought. But see, what true love is is a value that you place upon a person or event. That's what true love is. See, I love my wife not because I get all these romantic feelings every time I see her. Sometimes I want to choke her. <laughs> but I love my wife because I made a decision to put value upon that woman over 15 years ago. And our children need to understand what true love is. We need to express it to them and live it out. The fourth reason, and I need, I'm moving as fast as I can, because love is what will tear down the walls and allow the children to open up to us. See, when we begin to truly love our children and let them know that they are very special to us, what it will do is, is many of our children have built walls around their life, very early in life even. Because, because, see, a lot of our children are going through things that children should never have to go through. Do you realize that just recently I read a statistic that in America, a white child born since the year 1985 has only a 30% chance of reaching the age 17 living with both of his biological parents. 30% chance. If you go to the black race, it drops down to 7%. And we wonder why our children are walking around with walls up. Let me tell you the reason why. It's called self-preservation. See, that even, even at a very tender and a young age, they're going through such abuse and such hurt that they're building walls to try to protect themselves so that whenever you go to love on them, you run into a brick wall. But you know what? If you'll love them unconditionally and look beyond the face, hello, you got to look beyond the face because a lot of times they're going to try you. How many of you understand that? They're going to try you. They'll be ugly to you. They'll be mean to you. You know why they're trying you? They're trying to find out if you're really real and if you really do care. If you're willing to work with them long enough to, for them to tear those walls down. And see, one of the reasons we got to love them is because that love is what will tear the walls down and get them to start to open up to us. This is something I didn't understand early in my ministry. I remember I was at Milton First Assembly, which is my home church. I was there for eight and a half years. It's only about 30 minutes from here. And I remember laying in my bed one night, and I was crying. And we had been there for six months, and I was crying. And, I, and my wife said, what's wrong, Richard? And I said, sweetheart, we've been here for six months. Six months! And not one teenager has come to me with a serious problem. See, I was so not young and naive, I didn't understand that it takes a little bit longer than six months to tear down walls. See, it, it, it's, it's what tears, us down, 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 tears down those walls. This next quote, you can fill it in yourself, but it's worth repeating. See, they don't care how much you know until they first know how much you care. So let me share with you very quickly ways that we can communicate our love. The very first way we can communicate our love is, first of all, by our words. I think that we need to be expressive in our words to our children. We need to, we need to be free to share with them our words. But listen, we've got to go beyond just, let me tell you, I think we many times cheapen our words because we too quickly stand in front of our kids or, and we say these words, you know, I love you, come on back. And it's so empty, so cheap. I remember, I remember when I came to Brownsville, this was, this was our youth room. We had 70 kids in this room when I came here. I remember, boy, I felt like two peas in a pod in this big old room. 70 kids. And I remember that first sermon I preached. I preached 10, 10 things I expected from them and 10 things they expect from me. And I told them, I said, you can expect that I will not tell you that I love you until I love you. And it was over a year before I stood in front of my teenagers and said those words. 
Because I think we cheapen. We cheapen the words that we speak because we speak them when we don't really mean them. In your notes, jot it down. The only problem with words is that we can, they are very cheap unless we back them up with actions. See, we've got to back them up with actions. So the very first thing we need is we need to express our, our love with our words. But the second way we need to express our love is by our acts of love. By our acts of love. And, and let me share with you some quick ways of acts of love that we need to demonstrate consistently with our children to let them know that we genuinely care about them. The first one is the most important one, and that is we need to pray for them every day. We need to pray for them every day. I am an avid believer of praying for my teenagers. When I was at Southeastern Bible College, they taught me a lie. They didn't mean to, but they did. I remember, I remember it was in the pastoral care class, and the professor stood in front of us men, and he said, Fellas, if God called you to preach the gospel, never stoop so low as to become the President of the United States. I agree, I agree with that statement. But then he said this, because the call to preach the gospel is the highest call of man. I disagree. I disagree. The highest call of man is not to preach the gospel. The highest call of man is to fall on his knees before God and intercede for his people. See, it's one thing to talk to men on behalf of God. But it's another thing to talk to God on behalf of men. And I'll never forget, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, Richard, a man who does not intercede for his people has no right to preach to his people. I love the story where Jesus goes into the temple with a whip. I love that story. Get him, Jesus, get him! But you read five verses before that picture. Read five verses before the scripture that talks about the whip, and you'll see this picture. Jesus is standing over that city, and he's weeping. He's saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you'd only known your time of visitation. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Richard, never whip the people until you have first wept over the people. See, many of us, we want to correct everybody, don't we? We want to get in line, get in line, get in line. And we wonder why they blow up in the back. And, Who do you think you are? You're not my mama. I've had them say that to me, friend. You're not my mama. You know why they do that? Because they can feel that bitterness. It's not coming out of genuine love. I'll never forget the words of Bill Beecham at a conference I went to one time. He said, if you're doing more in ministry than you can bathe in prayer, you're setting yourself up for a great fall. Thank God for the message on prayer a while ago and intimacy with Christ. It starts there. We need to bathe our children in prayer every day. Second thing, and this is by no means in any order, but you know what? Give them up a phone call. Give them a phone call. You know what would do for a child? For an adult to call them up, just say, hey, I just want to check on you, see how you're doing. Phone calls can make all the world a difference. I make, I make, I make probably dozens of phone calls on any one given day to my teenagers. That's the reason I'm a terrible driver. I don't drive. I make phone calls. <laughs> and when I'm not making phone calls, I'm doing the third thing. I'm writing letters. Write a letter. You know what? You know how, you know how it makes you feel when you go to the mailbox and hallelujah, there's something besides a bill? <laughs> You see something handwritten, you go, thank you, Jesus. And how it just lifts your day. You know what it does for a child? Have you ever watched, how many of you have children that ever got anything in the mail? Friend, they go ballistic. You would think it was Christmas. You would think it was Christmas. When they get a letter, boy, it, that screams, I love you, I love you. You will not find me. You will not find me without my cards. I, I carry cards with me everywhere. And I may be driving by a high school or something, and I'll think of one of my students in that high school, and I'll just, I'll just reach in my bag, and I'll start pulling it out. You know, I'll put the phone down long enough to write a letter. And I'm driving down the road. We're at a stop sign. You know, you can, you know bless God. Watch out for me, Jesus. <laughs> and I'll just simply take out a pen real quick, and I'll say, Dear John. Well, I always say, Dear Saint John. I, I figure if I call them saints long enough, they'll pay, start to act like one. Dear St. John, just want to let you know I just drove by your school and I thought about you. John, I want you to know, man, you are incredible. I thank God that he brought you into my life and my ministry. When I look out over the young people and I see you worshiping, it always brings such joy and warmth to my heart. I can see the touch of God upon your life, and I believe in you. Oh, by the way, John, 
when I grow up, I want to become just like you. Because <laughs> you're my hero. That's how I always sign my letters. Love in Jesus, Brother Richard. I have parents that come up to me and say, Brother Richard, my 17-year-old son has your letter framed in his bedroom. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, dear God, it was just a letter. I wrote it on Mobile Highway. <laughs> you know why you know I teach my leaders? It's the little things in life that makes the difference. This is what separates the boys from the men. You, you, you would, you'd be unre it would be, it would, it would, your ministry would explode if you just start doing some little simple things like this. A little act of kindness and a little act of love. Write them a letter. D, why don't you go visit them? Go by their house. Pop in. Go by and see them. Say, hey, you just saw my heart. I was in the neighborhood. <laughs> neighborhood, that's 20 miles from the church. Well, you know, just want to come by and see how you're doing. Visit them. Another way is attend special events. Woo! Man, you got a kid that's on soccer team? I don't care if you don't know what the rules are. Go watch him play soccer anyway. You know what I'm saying? You got, you got one of your girls, and, you know, she's at, she's at, she, got, she got in the cheerleading squad. You know what I'm saying? They can't do cheers at that age. You know? they look, but, hey, go out there and scream at them anyway. Hey, good, good job. You jumped real good. You know, just. <laughs> you know, we expect them to come to our world all the time. It's time for us to return a visit and go to their world. Let me tell you, it will make, it will make, it will make them feel 10 feet tall to look out and they see their children's pastor out there. I'll go to events sometimes, and, and friend, they, they'll, forget that, they'll forget they're playing a game. You know, my youth pastor, he's up there. Hey, that's him right there. The ball goes by him. <laughs> There's my youth pastor. It means all the world to him, friend. Practical stuff. F, this is a no-no if you miss this one. You better remember their birthdays. Dear Jesus, don't commit the unpardonable sin of forgetting the birthday. See, I carry my calendar with me, and when I wake up in the morning, one of the very first things I do, well, the very first thing I do when I wake up is I say, good morning, Lord. I choose to serve you today. We're going to have a good day. It's always what I say before my feet roll out of the bed. But one of the very first things that I do when I go to my place of prayer, see, I believe the most important thing that you do in life should be the very first thing you do. What's the most important thing you're going to do today? I've already done it. And when I go to my place of prayer, I always open up my calendar and I find out whose birthday it is that day. Today's Molly Humphrey's 16th birthday, and it's Julie Hart's birthday, who's one of my leaders as well. And before the day is over with, I guarantee I'll be talking to them and wishing them a happy birthday. You better not forget the birthdays. You better not forget those special events. G, just a simple hug. And let me tell you something. I know we live in a perverted society, but don't be afraid to hug a kid. Listen, don't be afraid to hug a kid. I, I hug my kids all the time. I hug and kiss on my guys and my girls. And I'm very cautious. I'm very careful. Okay, I have a screening process. I, I take lawsuits very seriously. And again, I just want to say once again, I don't know if y'all talked about it this week or not, but let me tell you something. You better take lawsuits very seriously. There are a lot of perverts in our churches, maybe even some in this room. I'm not being ugly. But you realize maybe even this room that have problems some sexual problems, and the reason they want to get in your children's ministry is so that they can get their hands on your kids. And let me tell you something. There's also lawyers in school right now learning how to sue churches. And if you let, a, if you let an adult in your church or a teenager in your church get their hands on one of your children and they find out about it, you are up the creek, friend, without an alibi, and you better have done some screening process. Two years ago, I had two petty officers come from the police, uh, from the neighbor air station, to my office and they asked me they said do you know so-and-so I said I'm sorry I don't know him he said are you sure I said yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure um, I said I'll tell you what let's go to my files and I have a file and every one of my leaders application three personal references a criminal check and at one time I even did a fingerprint until I found out it wasn't doing any good and uh, but anyway criminal check before I meet with them and I took them and I showed them my files. And those two petty officers looked at each other in astonishment. They said, you know, they'd never seen this before. And they said to me, they said, it's probably a good thing you have those files. I said, why is that? He said, because we arrested this gentleman yesterday on two accounts of child molestation. 
and he said he was working with you in your ministry. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But let me tell you something. I refuse to let a perverted society tell me that I can't hug and kiss on my kids. And I will, I, will, I will from time to time bring my wife up in front of all my young people and I'll hold her close to me, bosom to bosom. I give her a kiss on the lips and I go, ladies, this is how we hug. And all the kids go, Wah! And then I'll call one of the girls up and I say, sweetheart, come here. And I'll come up there and I'll hold her to my side and I'll give her a kiss on the forehead and i say, now girls, this is how we hug. And I have her sit down. If ever a girl come hug me the wrong way, I go, ah, 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 ah. Remember how we hug. If I ever feel anything that's not healthy, I, I, I'll purposely put some ladies on her. I have all my leaders watch for me. See, they're supposed to protect me. I said, leaders, if you hear anything, if you know anything, you hear anything, this, this, any girls talking whatsoever, okay? But see, I don't have the problem now, okay? I'm, I'm kind of getting old. They all call me Papa Ricky now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they say it's an affectionate term, I don't know. I, if the Lord's good to me and lets me stay in youth ministry much longer, they'll be calling me Grandpappy Ricky. But, but I take lawsuits seriously. But let me tell you something. I, I just refuse to let anybody not, I mean, to let society say I can't hug and kiss on my kids. If you watch me tonight in service, I'll be in overflow, so you won't be there. But if you, if you see me, if you see me before service, many times there'll be half a dozen, a dozen kids line up around me. You know what they want? All they want is a hug and a kiss from Brother Richard. That's all they want. And there's always more girls than guys. How many of you understand that? Uh, there's always more girls than guys. And so what I'll do is I may have four or five girls come up, and there'll be two or three guys. And you know what I do? I will, I, will, I will purposely hold the guys a little bit longer than the girls. I'll hold them close to me. I'll hold them a little bit longer. And I will even do this. If there's four or five girls come up and a guy comes up, I'll reach through the girls, and I'll grab the guy, and I'll pull him through the girls, and i hold him while I talk to the girls to let everybody see everything's clean, everything's pure. You would not believe, listen, I could take you to my office. I've got hundreds of letters. And I ain't even kept near half of them. I just keep my favorite ones. I have hundreds of letters. There's not a day go by in my life that I don't receive a love note from one of my kids. Now I have hundreds of letters from my teenagers. And many of the letters say something like this. Thank you, Brother Richard, for loving me. Thank you for hugging and kissing me. You have hugged me and kissed me more than my own daddy. And we wonder why they're jumping in the back seat. Hello. But just a simple hug can change a child's life. Because, see, if we're saying that we love you but we're not willing to touch you, we're lying. And we do it in church every day. Oh, I'm, dear God, I'm not going to finish this one. We're going to have to skip some. H, remember their name. If you don't remember their name, friend, you're mud. Okay, let's just understand this. Let's not get spiritual, okay? Let's get real. The sweetest name to your ear is not Jesus. The sweetest name to your ear is your own name. Hello. Can we get straight for a minute? Jesus is a sweet name, is the sweetest name above all. But to you, it's your name. And when we have a child or a teenager that's in our ministry for a few months and we still can't call their name, what we're telling them is they're not important. And let me tell you, this is a real struggle of mine. I have literally done this on more than one occasion. I'll, I'll tell you about one because it was so funny. It happened right here in this, that, that foyer. I had a guy, he'd come to my youth group about every three or four weeks, just long, just, just enough to be a part of us, but, that, but spaced out enough that I could never catch his name. And I'm getting embarrassed, because if I don't know your name, I will ask you. I say, I'm sorry, man, because I, you know, I just, I don't like to say, hey, you, you know, or whatever, you know. And um, so I'm embarrassed. And so here comes this kid again, probably for about the sixth time, okay? And I go up to him and go, man, I'm sorry. I said, help me out again. What's your name? And he told me his name. I said, all right, listen, listen. I want you to know you're really important to me. And I've done this many times. I said, listen, if I can't tell you your name the next time, five bucks. He goes, five? He goes, what's wrong with ten? <laughs> That's what he said. I said, all right, ten. So I, shook, I got his name. I shook his name, hand. And you know what I did? I went straight to the bathroom, got a pen out, wrote his name on my hand. 
because I'm thrifty, friend. I'm not giving anybody 10 bucks. I wrote his, wrote his name down on my hand, and I learned that kid. You know what I did? I made it a priority. I learned that kid's name. And then, he, then, on top of that, he was anxious to get his 10 bucks. You know what I'm saying? So what's he do? He comes back the very next week. And he comes up to me. It was so funny because he made a beeline through those doors right for me. He comes up to me. He goes, and I called him my name. He goes, oh, man, dog. I'm going home. I came for my 10 bucks. H, spend quality time with them. I, excuse me, spend quality time with them. I'm trying to hurry, Jesus. Another way to spell love is T-I-M-E. Whoever gets the most time wins their heart. Hello. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump through some points here and I expound on them because I want to get down to, the, 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 uh, to some other stuff. Oh, this is, oh, Jesus. Two, a true shepherd not only loves them, but a true shepherd will feed his lambs. Will feed his lambs. Time and time again, you'll see scriptures in the Old Testament particularly where the Lord rebukes the shepherds because they're not taking care of the flock, but they're taking care of themselves. And let me say something. We need to feed our children. I do not believe that children are second-class citizens. Hello. I believe you need to spend as much time and work just as hard and pray just as much for your message for children as the senior pastor does for the senior adults in the, in the sanctuary. I believe that. Some of, us, some of us wonder why our ministries aren't growing. It's because all we're giving them is leftovers. We, we, we wait till Saturday and we pick up some curriculum and we try to throw something together and then wonder why they're not excited about it. You know what I learned? I learned that children always gather where food is. And it's not just pizza. Hello. You will not touch me on Thursdays. Now, I was in here. I was in here for 15 minutes yesterday and then I went right back into my study. Why? Because on Thursdays, nobody touches me. I'm crying. I'm, I'm seeking God. I'm asking God for a word from God for my teenagers. And you need to be doing the same thing for your children. There's a couple of things that I picked up on that I would encourage you to possibly do. See, there's, there's a couple of things. A, first of all, when I preach, I always preach with notes. I always preach just like I am right now. Always preach with notes. And there's a couple of reasons why I do that. First of all, when I preach with notes, it makes me have something to say. Hello, how many of you ever heard a preacher, man, I mean, he can stomp and stomp and turn red in the face and blood vessels come out and boy, he can get all excited and everybody else may get excited too because he's excited and, can, and excitement's contagious and you just, Wah! and then after it's all worth, over with, you go, what did we shout about? What did he say? Did he say anything? See, I wanted, I wanted to know that when I get up in the pulpit, I got something to say. Hello. And, and see, notes make me have something to say. Okay, and, and the second thing is I also want them to remember it. And uh, I, I usually have three hole punches that I put in my notes, and they put it right in my young people, put it right in their, their notebooks, and they take my note, sermons, and they re-preach them at school. It's great, friend. I re you, you, you don't believe that. Listen, if you want to get real discouraged about your ministry, go up to somebody after one of your hottest sermons. Go up to them the next day and ask them what you preached about. You'll quit the ministry. You, I promise you, you will I, I'm sick and tired. I'll meet people in the town, you know, that's from another church, and they'll come up to me and go, oh, Richard, you should have been in our church yesterday. Oh, it was incredible. Pastor preached the best sermon he's ever preached in his life. It was phenomenal. And I love the word, so I'm foaming at the mouth. I'm going, well, tell me, man, what, what, what was it? What was it? And they'll sit there and go, I, I, I don't, but it was good. I'm going to get out of my face. If I'm, going to, if I'm going to get a word from God, I want somebody to remember it. So that's another reason why I preach with the notes. So the, the second thing that I do when I preach is I usually preach in series. And the reason I preach in series is because kids don't hear you the first time. I said, kids don't hear you the first time. You've been with kids so long. I said, kids don't hear you the first time. I, it's the truth. Ask any parent. Okay, I never heard my mom tell me to take out the trash. Never. Until she hit a certain pitch in her voice or added my middle name. <laughs> you too, huh? 
And so I like to preach in series, okay? And um, normally I preach in series. Right now I'm in the middle of a series with my young people on emotional roller coasters. I broke away from it last night because I felt like the Lord was speaking something else to me. But I usually preach in series because it helps them to hear. I would rather them get 12 messages in a year than nothing all year. But we've got to feed them. Number three, a true shepherd will protect his lambs and brings to them a sense of security. Uh, um, protects his lambs and brings a sense of security. Psalms 23, I just got through doing a study on Psalms 23. I love this psalm. And um, in that it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We need to protect them from two different things. We need to protect them first from the predators. We need to protect them from the predators, those dangers outside. We need to warn them and so forth and so on. But we also need to protect them from themselves. I'll never forget the very first lesson Pastor Kilpatrick taught me when I came to this church. He was in his office and, and he said, Richard, he said, never forget that sheep are nearsighted. They're practically blind. They'll, they'll fall off the cliff grazing grass. That's how nearsighted they are. He said, sheep are nearsighted and they're on all fours. But the shepherd's on two legs and he can see where the sheep cannot see. I'll never forget that lesson. See, and as shepherds, we need, to, we, need to, we need to protect them, not only from the predators, but we need to protect them from themselves. And, and as I was studying on that psalm, I came, across, I came across some interesting material about the rod. Now, the rod is carried by the shepherd, and normally the rod is to beat off the predators, the bears and the lions that would come and attack the sheep. But, how many, but, but something else I found out about a shepherd, and that is this. If there's a particular lamb or sheep, we'll say, that keeps drifting off from the herd, what they'll do at first is they'll use the staff, which is the long, crooked thing, and they'll go over there and they'll, they'll put it around his neck or on its shoulder and he'll budge it back into the herd. But if that lamb or that sheep continuously, just constantly, starts drifting away from the herd into danger, and he's always having to leave the 99 to find the one and keeps nudging it back, if that happens repeatedly, time after time after time again, you know what that shepherd will do? That shepherd will go, and this time he won't use the staff. He'll take the rod. And he'll go up to that sheep, and it seems cruel at first, but stay with me. He'll go up to that sheep, and he'll take that rod, and he'll break one of its legs. And then he'll pick that sheep up, and he'll put it over his shoulders. How many of you have ever seen the picture of the shepherd with the sheep on his shoulders? Have you ever wondered why he was carrying it? It's because it had a broke leg. And see, he, he, carries it, he carries it on his shoulders so it's near his heart. And he'll carry that little sheep. He'll carry that sheep until the leg is healed. And during that period of time, and he, he does that for a couple of reasons. Number one, he wants to, that sheep to understand, I'm not being mean to you. I love you and I care for you. This is for your good. And he picks it up and he carries it. And during that period of time while that leg is being healed, there is a bond that's taking place between that shepherd and that sheep. And they say that by the time it's able to walk again and he's able to put that sheep down, that that sheep will never drift away again. We've got to be willing, we've got to be willing to confront our children, to confront their parents. It's easy to get on the kids, isn't it? But to confront their parents... It's the reason why I feel so passionate about that series I told you about yesterday, about caring enough to confront. The reason we don't care and confront people is because we care more about ourselves than we do about people. Listen, it's the truth. When I call people into my office, I cry more than they do. But I'll do it anyway. And my teenagers love me more after I get through confronting them than afterwards. Let me just give you one case in point. I had a 16-year-old guy and a 14-year-old girl starting to develop a romantic relationship with one another. I could see it happening. And I've done this, I've done this probably at least a half a dozen times in the last year alone. But I'll tell you about this one case. And they, they started, you could see it, you could see it happening. And I, I called in the guy, he's 16, I called him in first. And I said, son, I said, I noticed that you and this young lady are starting to develop a romantic relationship. And he goes, oh no, Brother Richard, we're just friends, we're just friends. I said, son, listen to me. I've been a teenager before. Back with Flintstones, I, I dated Wilma. 
I've been a teenager before, and I've been in youth ministry for over 15 years. I know the looks. I know the behavior. I said, son, y'all are developing a romantic relationship. Finally, he, he goes, yeah, I do. I do like her, da, 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 da. I said, well, let me tell you something. I want you to break it off. I said, I want it to go any further. I said, you, you realize that the odds of you, 16 and her, 14, the odds of you guys maintaining a pure romantic relationship long enough to get married one day is like 0.001% chance. I said, you're just setting yourself up to get hurt and to hurt her. Besides, not only that, but this young lady was very vulnerable. She's from a divorced home, and she was not living with either one of her parents at the time. She was living with a family member in the church. She was living with a, a, a family in the church, not even related. How many of you realize she's very vulnerable for affection? And I said, son, I said, you're a fine young man. I know that you're not wanting to take advantage of her, da, 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 but I tell you what, it's not healthy. I said, you are to talk to her tonight before revival, and you're to break it off, and I'm going to call you tomorrow and make sure it's done. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. And I said, oh, by the way, I'm going to call her in here a few, in a few, few hours. She's coming, and, and she knows. So I'm going to call you tomorrow. I expect it to be done. Yes, sir. I called the young lady in a couple hours later. And I said, sweetheart, I noticed that you and this young man are, are starting to stir romantic feelings for one another. Oh, no, Brother Richard. I said, sweetheart, he's already confessed. She goes, oh. I said, sweetheart, I talked to him a couple hours ago, and, and I told him that he's to break it off. Now, he's going to talk to you tonight, and he's supposed to break it off. Y'all just need to be friends. I said, sweetheart, it's not healthy for you. You're vulnerable. Y'all are both wonderful teenagers, but you're vulnerable. And, and I fear for you. It's not healthy for you. And I, I care about you enough that I'm not going to allow this to happen. Do you understand? He's going to talk to you now, and I'm going to call you tomorrow. You understand me? Yes, sir, Brother Richard. They, dealt, but they did business that night. The next day I called them. Yes, sir, Brother Richard, we took care of it. It wasn't three days later. It wasn't three days later that both of those teenagers had two different separate occasions went out of their way to find me. And with a smile from ear to ear, and with a glow in their eyes, they said, Brother Richard, thank you. Thank you for loving me enough to not let me get involved in that relationship. Now, let me tell you something. They don't all turn out that way. I've got teenagers in this city that hate my guts. But you know what? I, as a pastor, have got to lovingly protect them even from themselves. And if we're not willing to do that, we're not a true shepherd. We're what the Bible refers to as a hireling. We've got to protect them. In your notes, jot it down, and, I, and I, I'm moving to a close. Much of what we call rebellion is not rebellion at all, but it is our children simply crying out for someone to give them the guidelines. You realize that we have a generation that has no guidelines. You realize that right now, Going through our government, our laws legalizing homosexuality. It was on the news yesterday. Homosexual marriages all across our land. They're rewriting all the laws. Our children are growing up in a very confused society. They don't know where the guidelines are at, and therefore they're afraid. I'll never forget an illustration or a, an experiment that James Dobson shared that he had done with some children. This happened about five years ago. They found a big open field and had built some playground equipment right in the middle of the field. They took a second grade class to this big open field and they told the children, they said, children, you can play anywhere you want to. And they watched the children for over an hour as they stayed right there in the middle of the field around the playground equipment. They then built a big strong fence around the big field. They took the same class to the same field, gave them the same instructions. You can play anywhere you want to. And within five minutes, the children were playing all the way to the fence line. Do you know why? They knew where the boundaries were. See, boundaries don't restrict. They give us freedom. And a lot of, a lot of what we call rebellion with this generation is not rebellion. It's them screaming out saying, Will somebody tell me what the guidelines are? Will somebody be consistent? And as a shepherd, we've got to do that. And number four, a true shepherd leads and guides his lambs. Leads and guides his lambs. Notice I say leads his lambs. Our problem is, is 
there's, there's too many pastors who want to be their people's friend and not their pastor. There's too many parents that want to be their children's friend instead of their parent. Let me tell you something. I'm not interested in becoming my teenager's friend. I am their pastor. And if I'm a good pastor, I'll become their friend. But that's not my first priority. Hello. Our first priority is to be their leader. You cannot lead and be one of them. And, and we've, got to, we've got to lead them. My theme verse for my ministry from day one has been 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Follow me as I follow Christ. Listen to me. I'm not very gifted. I, I don't have very many abilities, but let me tell you what I can do. I can love God and love teenagers, and I can be a man of God. And I tell my young people, you can go anywhere I go, do anything I do, say anything I do, have any attitude that I have, and I promise you, you will not bring a reproach to Christ or to this church. I said, Brother Richard, that's a pretty strong statement. Let me tell you something. You, better, you and I had better start living that way. We cannot stand in front of children anymore and say these words. And every one of us probably heard them said, if you've been in church very long, possibly you've even said them yourself, but you better not do it anymore. It sounds real spiritual, but it is not biblical to stand in a pulpit and say to a congregation, church, children, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Well, that sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? Show me that in Scripture. Just show me that in Scripture. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You know what Paul was really saying there? That word, that follow, the word follow there is the Greek word mimeo, which is where we get mimeograph, mimic. Paul was saying this. Most of you have never got to meet Jesus because Jesus was only at one place at one time. Most of you never got to meet the man named Jesus. And many of you would like to know what Jesus was like. Do you want to know what Jesus was like? Watch me. Now, that's a strong statement. But I tell my young people that. You go, Brother Richard, you tell me that you're perfect. Absolutely not. But I'll be the first one also to fall in front of my teenagers. I've done it dozens of times. Say, man, I'm sorry, Sam. I had a terrible attitude. I had no right to talk to you that way, buddy. Would you forgive me, man? I'm sorry. I'll fall on my face before my kids in a heartbeat. And I say, man, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? not a weakness, it's a strength. Let me tell you, the greatest thing that you can do for your kids, the greatest thing you can do for your kids is to become a man or a woman of God. The greatest thing you can do for your kids is not to find some curriculum to take home. The greatest thing you can do for your kids is to become a man or a woman of God. Because see, you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. In your notes, you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. I tell youth pastors all the time, the reason we have a lot of fleshly youth ministries is because we have a lot of fleshly youth pastors. The reason we have a lot of fleshly churches is because we have a lot of fleshly pastors. See, there's a principles in God's word. John 3, 6 says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. If you want a spiritual, strong, thriving youth and children's ministry, it's going to be based upon you becoming a man or a woman of God. That's exactly what John said. I challenge you. I challenge you this morning, this afternoon. Be a man or a woman of God. Put your children first. Love them unconditionally. Preach the word to them. No games. All the way. That's what they want. And God will bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I've done the very best that I can to pour my heart before these people. Lord, these men and women of God that you've raised up to touch this generation, I ask, Lord, that they would take it to heart and not hear, be just hearers of the word, but may they be doers of the word as well. Father, make us men and women of God that can raise up a generation that will take back our land. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Pastor Vance.